Thanks, Jan. Thanks for playing tonight. And Neil is recording tonight's service, so you're all, all going to be on TV, okay? So, the, um, thanks to Tasha tonight for sharing her faith journey. This is kind of the final one in our journey of faith throughout this Lenten season. So we we appreciate very much you're doing that. I'd like to call your attention the people that are on the prayer list. We have some additional names. Uh, the Phyllis, we remember Phyllis Michael in our prayers tonight. Uh, uh, remember the Rail family in our prayers, the family and friends of Charlie Gabehart, and also the family and friends of Kenton Ward. Lots of prayer concerns. Uh, 40 minutes in Lent, our midweek uh, Bible study um, takes place on Wednesdays from 6.30 to 7.10. And you are invited. It takes place in the sanctuary. This week's the last one, I believe. So please keep that in mind. Church League Golf um, is fast approaching. If you want to play, there is a sign-up sheet out there. Or you can uh, call the church office or email Kelsey. So um, Wednesday evening, children's and youth activities uh, will resume uh, on April 7th. So please keep that in mind. And that's about all the announcements I have. I invite you to stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, Pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world. So, amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
For those of you who have been members here for a few years, I'd like to ask you to think about how many times you've seen me up here reading lessons or speaking. Now I realize new members and those of you who only attend on Saturdays will say, never. And actually, that's the correct answer. Being up front is not in my comfort zone. Pastor Tim caught me in the middle of what some might call a midlife crisis, which I refer to as a midlife awakening. Luckily, I had moved past the say no to everything stage and simply replied with let me think about it, which was my way of buying time to figure out how to say no. But God works in mysterious ways, so on the morning I had planned to give my response, I woke up at 3 a.m. and knew that I should do this. I have a pretty good working relationship with God, and apparently I'm supposed to tell you how I got here. On my mom's side, our family immigrated to the U.S. in the 1800s as Lutherans, and I was the first of the fifth generation of Lutherans here. Our family was always active in the church. My mom taught Sunday school and Bible school from the time I was three or four. Although I don't remember the church we attended in Colorado Springs during those early years, I can still sing a few of the songs we learned at that age. When I was five, we moved to McPherson and became members at Trinity. Sitting in the pew Sunday mornings with my grandparents, aunt or great aunt, and watching them participate in many roles through the years, church, Sunday, or choir, Sunday school, usher, council, committees, circles, and even church secretary. My dad rarely attended with us, but he willingly shuttled us on Sundays when my mom, brother, and I had to be there at different times, back in the days of one family car. So faith was never a question in my growing up. It was a given, although not something we really talked about. We said nightly prayers, but table grace was only when we gathered with extended family. And all my friends, but one, attended church somewhere. Occasionally, I went to other churches with friends, such as the Presbyterian or First United Methodist, but I always preferred the liturgy, music, and flow of Lutheran worship. I had one friend whose parents didn't attend church much, so she actually tried out different churches and youth groups herself through the junior high and high school years. I found that intriguing and brave. While she was doing that, I was busy with mission work, national youth gathering, Bible school, weekly youth group activities, bell choir, and confirmation classes with my friends. I remember being so terrified of having to go in front of the church council and answer questions at the end of those classes. Apparently, I passed because I was confirmed and have the traditional photo of the robe-wearing confirmation class to prove it. I discovered my opinion of the Lutheran Church as being the definition of steadfast love, not showy, not changing all the time, not trying all the latest things to lure people in. To me, being a Lutheran is glorifying God in a pure and humble way. Through the college years, I didn't attend church regularly, though I did work for Lutheran Campus Ministry prepping meals for their Wednesday night group at Kansas State. It was also during the college years that I met Marlon, my husband, who was more Catholic than I was Lutheran. Before we dated very long, there was a discussion about how we would handle religion if this ended up being a long-term relationship. When we first married, we were in a new place and didn't get around to finding a church until we had our first child. We knew then it was time to commit, and we joined Emmanuel with an I in Salina. We promptly found out we would be moving with Marlin's job in a few months. This time we knew not to wait. So in 1998, shortly after moving to Hutchinson, we joined Emmanuel with an E. Through the years, I followed in the family footsteps and have been active in many roles here at the church. Joining a church when you have young children makes it easier to be involved in activities, and we were lucky to raise our three alongside several other families, which became a great group of friends. Wednesday night meals and the time waiting to pick up kids after choir or confirmation led to chats about parenting and mom's struggles or wins. That was something I looked forward to each week. I would guess I'm not alone when I say my faith came into question and service the most while parenting. 
It wasn't just the moms in our stage of life that helped support my faith during those years. The interaction, support, and relationship with members here, spanning several decades, has been a blessing as well. Even though I've always been comfortable talking to God throughout the day, and not just in formal prayer, I began to question at one point if I really was a good Christian. I've never read the Bible much and wasn't comfortable praising God out in the community. Blatant evangelizing has never been my thing. Seeing others quoting the Bible or publicly professing their faith and talking openly about Jesus or God's plan for them made me feel inferior. And as I struggled with that off and on for years until Pastor Tim had a message one Sunday, which I really don't remember. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But I do remember how it made me feel. It was as though my eyes were opened and a weight was lifted. I'm betting it was about Matthew chapter 6, which is paraphrased like this. When you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Also, early in my adult years, my mom gave me the very good advice to keep a list of God's answer to prayers. Nowadays, it might be called a blessings or gratitude journal. And it's amazing how you'll recognize how God is active in your life once you start looking. From really small things like wondering how we were going to pay for a small but unexpected expense as a young family on a budget, praying about it, then the next day receiving a check in the mail for some refund that we had not known was coming in the exact amount needed, to having a friend recommend years later signing up for an online Lenten Bible study on praying. This Bible study not only got me focused on praying big prayers, but also started my Bible reading at the beginning of the hardest year of my life. So because of my list, I was not only able to pray my way through the very hard 20. 2017, where we said goodbye to parents while helping our kids through teenage struggles. But because of the journal, I also recognized God's hand in getting me to that point. The midlife awakening I referred to earlier has me doing a morning devotional and Bible reading each day, which is helping me feel more powerful in my faith. With our kids mostly out of the house, I've had time to expand my circle of friends, giving me opportunities to broaden and deepen my faith and participate in personal development courses. I'm learning to embrace the hard things instead of ignoring them, which allows me to more fully embrace the joyful things God provides. As for parenting, we are still a resource for our kids and still teaching about faith as they grow into adults and are influenced by new groups of people. I know all of us here are a mixed lot. Some of you can relate to being raised Lutheran, while others can't. But I hope that my story will help you realize we're never too old to grow our faith and we're always influencing others through our everyday actions. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. If I didn't know better, I would think there is some kind of correlation between Lutheran churches and vowels. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. It was funnier in my head. <laughs> Our first reading this evening comes from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, 
from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. The second reading comes from the book of Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. and Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now this is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated. Tasha, thanks for saying yes in a weak moment or whatever moment. It's always been a pleasure to be with you and your family and to watch your children grow and be a part of your family's lives. So I give thanks for that. There were some Greeks that came to Philip. And they said to Philip, we wish to see Jesus. It's probably a request that the disciples heard again and again. Different people at different times wanted to meet Jesus. A 
And maybe the disciples thought it was their job to scream people. To kind of run interference for Jesus. Philip goes to Andrew. Andrew and Philip go to Jesus. Remember the children who were brought to Jesus that he might lay hands on them and bless them? The disciples try to interrupt that. Jesus interrupts the disciples. There was something that drew people to Jesus. There was something that drew the disciples to give up their families, their livelihoods, and follow an itinerant preacher across the countryside learn from him. There is something that touched your soul and brought you into a relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Maybe it was Jesus' ethic of love. Love one another as I have loved you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Maybe it was that radical idea that you're supposed to forgive someone who has wronged you. Maybe it was Jesus' lifestyle. You know, walk in the countryside free and easy. No possessions to speak of. No schedules to keep. Just meeting people. Listening to people. Engaging in their lives. He had a way of doing it. Jesus had a way of connecting with people. You see it all sorts of people. There are poor people and rich people that connect with Jesus. There are people from all different socioeconomic groups. There are Greeks and there are Jews and there are Samaritans. Speaking of Samaritans... Jesus would make a good Samaritan the hero of a story giving help and aid to a man who had fell among robbers and been beaten and left on the road to die. But there were some people that Jesus couldn't connect with. They were people that were looking for power and position and control. You see, Jesus could come to change the world That was really the message of the gospel. To turn the world upside down, to change it. You don't have to look to political structures to do it. You've got a Lord that wants to lead you in the way to change the world. Powerfully and dramatically. Jesus walked the countryside, connecting with people, listening to people. 
making a difference in their lives. And notice how he does it. He gives up himself. He loses himself. And that's what he calls us to do. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So how is the church today going to show the presence of Jesus to the world? We're going to do it by speaking and by acting and by holding as important and valuing those things that Jesus held as important. It's not about power. It's not about position. It's not about control. It's about change. Radical change. Years ago, the Betty Crocker Company embarked upon an easy cake mix They came up with the recipe and put it on shelves. All you had to do was add water. But it didn't sell. They wondered why sales were so low and poor. They commissioned a study for their company, and what they found out was that it was too easy. It didn't ask people to invest something in the process other than water. They came up with an idea. Well, have them add an egg to the recipe. (laughs) And it sold. And it continues to sell. You see, There's something powerful when we invest ourselves in something. You want to show the world the presence of Jesus, you got to lose your life. You got to lose yourself for the sake of your neighbor and others. You have to be willing to surrender yourself in service to God. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. You want to show people the presence of Jesus? Then speak like it. And act like it. And hold as important those things that Jesus held as important. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may that peace keep your hearts and your minds. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able.
as we rehearse the articles of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. You wash us through and through and remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive. Through them, show the world new possibilities. Bless the ministries of repentance and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, you promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace, and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Lord, in your mercy, you sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence, those who are lonely or feel unforgiven, those who need healing of mind or body, those who are dying, and all who grieve. Especially this day, we pray for Adam, Tracy and Clara Younger, Beckham Carey, Dale Henderson, Lachlan DeBoer, Don Mikesell, Jim Haas, William Lang, Pat Sawyer, Chris and Nancy Sawyer, James Harris, Shirley Rail, Tanya Parker, Ken Schmidt, Denise Lang, Nancy McConnell, Azalea Johnson, John Ernst, Phyllis Mikesell, the Rail family, and the family and friends of Dorothy Armstrong, and family and friends of Karan Miller, the family and friends of Charlie Gabehart, and the family and friends of Kenton Ward. Lord, in your mercy, in the cross of Christ, your name is glorified. We praise you for those who have given us, given us words to worship you. With all those who have died in Christ, bring us into everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend